it's not too often that in a class in computer science you get to study things from the 1860s, 1870s a little bit here, but today we get to do it, so get excited. The Maxwell Cremona Correspondence, one of the coolest um, classic results I know uh, in a way that this, this simple idea encodes uh, an entire theory of discrete calculus. And we're going to get to see only a little bit of it, but we'll see the, the result and also its proof. So the main objects of study here are planar graphs. And you'll see these little arrows. They may look familiar to you from physics class. These are free body diagrams. So this is some kinds of forces acting on the vertices. And they're forces just like in Tut's algorithm. Uh, literally exactly like in Tut's algorithm, although we're going to allow some new spring constants. And then we're going to think about lifting it up so that what we actually had in the plane was just a drawing of some projection of something that really lived in 3D. And so we're going to look at equilibrium here and liftings here. So those are the, this is the main idea. So this really goes back to the work of James Clerk Maxwell in 1864. Uh, although Luigi Cremona uh, did a lot of work on very related things um, based on the works of Maxwell. And I, this is often called the Maxwell-Cremona correspondence. Okay, so we're going to go between equilibrium stresses. And this is going to be spring constants. Assigning spring constants to make everything balance out. In the case of Tut's algorithm, remember all the spring constants were just one. Uh, this is exactly analogous to the circuit stuff we did where we assumed all the resistors were one, but then we also looked at the cases with other resistors. Um, and then lifting is going to be, well, it's a height function. All right. Now, we're going to do this in two videos. In the first video, we're just going to get half of this. And the way this is most cleanly presented, I think, is to look at the way James Clerk Maxwell did it himself, which was to look at what's called a reciprocal diagram. All right, and uh, this, is, this is Maxwell's term. And Maxwell used this idea of a reciprocal partly, I think, partly as a metaphor uh, for other kinds of dualities, maybe the most common kind of duality you see, which is, say, taking the, uh, the reciprocal of a number, and you take the reciprocal of the reciprocal, and you get back to where you started. Well, he wanted the same thing with planar graphs, uh, and so this is really a kind of dual drawing. And what we'll see is that equilibrium stresses can be turned into these kinds of special kind of drawings of the dual, and the, these reciprocal drawings, reciprocal diagrams, can also give you uh, spring constants for an equilibrium stress. And similarly, so in the second video, like this is what we'll do today, um, but in the other video, I'm going to show how to relate these reciprocal diagrams to lifting. So this right here is where we're going to spend our time in this video. All right, first, what really is an equilibrium stress? We're going to treat each edge as a spring. So E is an edge, SE is going to be its spring constant. And just like we saw with circuits, in order to get a kind of uh, Laplacian-like system to describe the net forces, rather than just taking the standard Laplacian, right, we put a diagonal matrix in the middle, where this big matrix S is uh, the matrix with all the spring constants in it. So just like with resistors. And P here, this is the positions of the points, so that is a linear drawing. Positions of points. And when you do this, uh, the result is just, again, the net force at each vertex. Okay, because uh, this is going to take each uh, the positions. The co-boundary will turn it into vectors on the edges. They will be multiplied by the spring constant, and then they will be summed up at each vertex. Right, so that's the three steps here. You take the positions, turn them into vectors, scale them by Hooke's law, and then add them up. Right? And adding them up, of course, is just how you find net forces all the time. Uh, it's adding up the forces in a free body diagram. Let's do an example uh, with a little bit of care. Um, I've scaled down 
the, uh, the red vectors here just so that they fit on the page. Here's a planar graph. It's a square broken into four triangles. It's got five vertices, it's got eight edges. Now, it's actually a drawing, it's a linear drawing, and so I marked some lengths here. So I'm gonna say that this is length one, and you know the Pythagorean theorem, so this is length square root of two here. And what I would like is a set of spring constants that causes this system to be in equilibrium. If we were running Tut's algorithm, we would pin these down and we would only, we would use spring constants of one on the inside. And of course, this is the drawing we would get. But if you did that, then you would have some net force on the outside. So clearly we're gonna need some of these springs to be pushing and some to be pulling. That is, some will be positive and some will be negative and that way it will balance out. Okay, so here's, here's an assignment that I think works. We'll double check. So I think if I put two on all these and negative one on all these, I think it works. So I've labeled it here. So the force from this spring, we're gonna look just at this one vertex here. And this spring here, well, it's got length one and spring constant two. So it's going to provide a force of magnitude two in this direction. This edge here, it has length square root of two. It has spring constant negative one. So it's gonna be square root of two uh, length, is gonna be the length of the force and then it's gonna be in this direction, right? The minus means it's going away. It's a pushing instead of a pulling. And similarly, this one is gonna be square root of two. So if I pull this one out, here's my free body diagram for that vertex. I wanna know what the sum of the forces is. And it's not too hard to check that if you add them all up, they come together into this nice triangle, and therefore, the sum of the forces is zero. Now, this idea of looking at the forces coming out of the vertex and then adding them up, if they add up to zero, the fact that they can be put together into a polygon is a pretty useful, neat idea. In fact, you'll see that uh, if there are three edges coming in, that means there are also three adjacent faces, and so that polygon will be a triangle. And so this starts already to look like duality where you take a vertex and in its dual, it will be a face whose number of sides is equal to the number of edges coming out. And in fact, this is exactly what we'll get when we look at the reciprocal diagram uh, up to perhaps a rotation by 90 degrees. So here is the reciprocal diagram. Um, if G is planar and three connected, and H is the dual of G, right? We'll give the dual a new name just so we don't have to leave around too many uh, stars. And so I have a linear drawing of P. So you think of this perhaps as a matrix, an N by two matrix, right? For each of the N points, I have two coordinates. It's X and Y coordinates. That's my linear drawing of G. And F is gonna be a linear drawing of H. And so it has, uh, well, I guess, however many faces G had, that's how many um, rows there are in this matrix. And then it's got two columns you know, for X and Y. All right. And so we're gonna say that if I have these two linear drawings, that these are gonna be reciprocal if, if I look at any edge, and now actually, let me, let me point out this handy notation. For an edge UV in the graph, it also has a dual edge XY and when we write it like this, we're just gonna assume that these are properly oriented with respect to each other. So see the last video um, to be clear about what that means. Um, so I have any edge like this, then uh, it should be that they actually are orthogonal. So they actually meet at a right angle. Oh, they don't even have to meet, but actually as vectors, they have to make a right angle. So what are these as vectors? So there's PU minus PV that is a vector, which is kind of the difference between the two points. And to be orthogonal means that the dot product will be zero. And so fx minus fy equals zero. So this will be the condition uh, for being a reciprocal diagram, really. It's, it's a relationship between a drawing of the graph and a drawing of its dual. So from a reciprocal diagram, we can get an equilibrium stress. 
here's the idea. Um, so if I have the reciprocal diagram, this is the condition that I must have had at every edge. So for a given edge, um, in other words, if this is, uh, if these are orthogonal to each other, then if I rotate one of them by 90 degrees, then they'll be parallel. Okay, so I'll take a rotation matrix. If you haven't seen it, there's a matrix that will do a 90 degree rotation. And I'll, so I'll rotate this PU minus PV. And it must be then that uh, this vector is some scaling times this vector. All right, so, um, so I rotated this and now they're parallel. And the question is how much longer is one than the other? And so if that's the case, then I can write, right, this is going to be true if and only if I can take uh, the co-boundary of F, the co-boundary um, in the, this dual graph, right, this is going to give me a vector of all these differences for all the edges, right? So this is going to give me a matrix vector way of writing out all of these constraints for all the edges in the matrix form. And it looks very nice. It is just like this. Okay, so the co-boundary of the graph uh, times P is gonna give us all of these differences. And then they get scaled up each by the spring constant. So S again is this diagonal matrix of spring constants. And I still have my rotation lying around in there. All right, so if this is true, then uh, what I what do I do now? Actually, no, let's let's think about this. What am I trying to find? I was trying to find this equilibrium stress. I had a reciprocal diagram, and now it seems like I found the equilibrium stress. Um, but I need to check that it actually is an equilibrium stress. And the condition for being an equilibrium stress was that what that weighted Laplacian thing was supposed to come out to zero. So in particular, I was supposed to compute this boundary of G S boundary of G transpose P. And I want to check that this is really equal to zero. So to do that, it's not too hard to see that if I move this over to the other side, take uh, maybe multiply both sides by R inverse, that, that would be like rotating 90 degrees the other way. I get that this is boundary of G times S, um, oops, times, sorry, let me, uh, times boundary H transpose F R inverse. Whew. Okay, which seems like a big mess, but you know what? When properly oriented, these two cancel each other out. So this is just zero, and that's why it's zero. And so now I've, I've actually not only found the stress, I have a nice, easy way to see what that stress really is. See, on any edge, it's going to be equal to, uh, I'll put plus or minus here because it depends on the orientation exactly, but uh, on that edge, it's going to be um, the difference in the lengths of these two vectors. Okay, so there was a rotation there, but the rotation doesn't affect the length. So how much did each edge get stretched when I went from the primal to the dual? And did the orientation get flipped, right? Did it go from a left-right turn or a right-left turn? All right, so that's, that's going to give me the uh, stresses in an equilibrium stress. And we just checked right here. This was the only condition you needed to be in equilibrium stress, and we got it. All right. So the other direction is if I have an equilibrium stress, uh, I would like to have also a reciprocal diagram that if you give me some way you give me some S so that it assigns spring constants to the vertices, um, to the edges, then, uh, and it cancels out all the forces, then I should be able to give you some F, which is now a drawing of the dual, which has this, again, this somewhat weird condition here, but this is the condition for being uh, a reciprocal diagram. And if you look, it seems real easy because all of these things are known in this case. If, if someone gives you the equilibrium stress, that means they gave you S, you know what the graph is, you have already have a drawing of the graph, and you know how to rotate it. So this is all known. Uh, and you're just trying to find F, which means that this is just solving one linear system. So you solve for F. Now, the, the story 
it would be done there. It seems like, ah, oh, maybe we're just done. Uh, except uh, we're not. Well, we should be careful at least. Um, you see, just because you have a linear system doesn't mean you can solve it. We need to check that you can solve this linear system. And at first, I don't think it's at all obvious that there's necessarily a solution here. Um, hmm. So one thing you can try is, is say, well, this is going to be a, there's going to be a solution to this linear system if this right hand side is in the image of this uh, matrix as a linear transformation. Um, but we know something about this image. You know, the image of this is actually equal to, right, when properly oriented, that's exactly equal to the kernel of the boundary of G. So, um, checking that this system has a solution is the same as checking that this right-hand side is in the kernel of this map. And so, to check if it's in the kernel, well, we could just do the multiplication and see if it gets zero. Right? That is, we could just multiply this times the whole right-hand side, which is S R. And now we're golden, right? Piece of cake. Because it was part of our hypothesis, right, that this whole thing was going to be equal to zero. So the whole thing is equal to zero. All right, zero times R is zero. There we go. So given the equilibrium stress, it also gives me a reciprocal diagram. and I can find it. I just need to solve one system of linear equations. All right, to uh, recap here, uh, we've got just the first half of the maxwell cremona correspondence. We looked at equilibrium stresses. That is, this is assignments of spring constants to the edges. Um, in all of this, we are assuming that drawing is given, but we assign spring constants to the edges so that all the forces equal out. And if we can do that, we can also get this nice drawing of the dual where all the edges are orthogonal to their dual edges. And again, remember, it was important that some of the spring constants, uh, they can't all be positive. We kind of saw this in the case of Tut's algorithm, where we tried to do, uh, say, all positive spring constants, and the whole thing just collapses to one point. So there has to be some pushing and pulling to balance out. Um, but, but then it turns out it all works out, and you get a reciprocal diagram. And hopefully it wasn't too, wouldn't be too surprising to see that actually these notions are really dual to each other. You can also get an equilibrium stress on the dual.